Okay, good afternoon and uh, welcome uh, to this afternoon's uh, politics uh, faculty panel discussion on virtue and citizenship. Um, we had a little bit of false advertising. Uh, two of our members, uh, as a result of illness, are not able to be here, Dr. Gielfres and Dr. Culp, uh, but we will marshal on uh, as best we can. Uh, so the order in which we will go is uh, first Dr. Burns uh, will speak about uh, Christianity and citizenship. Uh, then Dr. Upham will speak about the uh, founders on the privileges and what he's calling the corresponding virtues of citizenship. Uh, then Dr. Miller will speak on the progressive transformation of civic virtue. Uh, and then I will uh, uh, end up speaking about citizenship in contemporary uh, America. So uh, please welcome Dr. Burns. The title of my talk, is this working right now? How's that? The title of my talk is, Do Christians Need Civic Virtue? It may seem like an odd question to begin with on a panel like this. We had a panel on the election last semester and nobody asked the question, do we need elections? <laughs> but it might, if it might be obvious that Americans need elections, I would like to point out it is far from obvious that Christians need or should care about civic virtue. I realize they're not all Christians, but this is a Christian school, so let me briefly remind you of some of the evidence that what Christianity offers the world is actually a powerful alternative to civic virtue rather than any comfortable support for civic virtue. One of the few political communities we know of that most embodied civic virtue or devotion to one's political community was ancient Rome. Christians worship a man who was executed as a convicted traitor against ancient Rome. Thousands of Christians went on to accept death rather than obey the laws as good Roman citizens would. Centuries later, when men like Machiavelli and Rousseau were nostalgic for ancient Roman virtue, they pointed out how much Christianity seems to have weakened the patriotism, the love of fatherland, that had been the fire animating this astonishing civic virtue of the ancient Romans. Good Christians, these later philosophers complained, loved their souls more than their cities. They were too attached to the heavenly homeland to care all that much about the earthly homeland, or rather not the earthly homeland, the land they happened to be passing through during their brief pilgrimage. Christians had a faith in divine providence that allowed them to say, if we happen to live under a tyranny, God's will be done. It should be accepted as penance for our sins. And this life is a veil of tears anyway, so don't make too much of a fuss about it. Christians were better at forgiving their enemies than at fighting them. As soldiers, they were better at dying for their country than at killing for it. And as General Pat reminds us, you don't win a war just by dying for your country. Christians would follow Christ's order and pay their taxes. They would follow St. Augustine's advice and use the earthly city on pilgrimage to the heavenly city. But use is not really the way a real patriot talks about his homeland. And in general, Christians seem to want most of all that the government would just leave them in peace to engage in the prayer and works of charity that made the real focus of their lives. They were good subjects, but not really citizens. Now, when Christians today hear accusations like this, when they read Machiavelli or anybody else like this, if I can at least judge from the experience of myself and many of my friends, one understandable reaction is, well, sure, we do care more about our souls than our cities. We do think this life is short and a pilgrimage and a veil of tears, and we don't think politics can change that. We do think that you can worship God even under a tyranny. We do think prayer and charity are more important than political rule. We do worship a man who voluntarily turned down political rule on more than one occasion. And frankly, we do think, and we've got centuries of martyrs to back us up on this one, that civic virtue is overrated. If Christians don't have civic virtue, so what? Too bad for civic virtue, you could say. But I don't say that. I've said it at other times in my life, and sometimes I'm still tempted to, but I no longer honestly think that I can. And the author who most convinced me that I can't say it is actually St. Augustine himself, although people often associate Augustine with precisely the views that I was just laying out. I'd like then to briefly talk about a few of the considerations about these matters that 
uh, St. Augustine brings up in an early work of his, but one of the Liber Arbitria, which among other things is I think meant to be a criticism of the Christian temptation to ignore politics or to think oneself above caring about it. Everything I'm going to say falls more or less under one heading, which is this. You can't understand morality if you don't understand politics. That's a bold claim, so let me make it again. You don't understand morality if you don't understand politics. When I say morality, I include Christian morality. This is far from obvious, to say the least. So let me go through a few things Christians often say about morality that would seem to make Christian virtue completely independent of civic virtue, and then let me show why they don't work. One such statement would be, we don't need to listen to our political communities we just follow the Ten Commandments. Let's go through a few of those commandments. Don't steal. So don't take what belongs to your neighbor. How do I know what belongs to my neighbor? What defines whose property, whose stuff belongs to whom? Usually it's the law. I've just signed a contract on a house. We close in, in 28 days. If I walk into that house in 27 days and say, this is mine now, that's stealing. I should go to confession. If I go in, into 29, and then 29 days, that's not stealing. I shouldn't go, well, I shouldn't go to confession for that, anyway. What magic has happened in the meantime? We've signed a contract, and it's a contract whose terms are set by Texas law, the law of our political community. There are also marriage laws. Now, you could say the Christian church should be regulating Christian marriages. How about marriages among non-Christians? Can a Christian woman marry a non-Christian man who's been living with another woman? Well, if he cleans up his act, sure. Can she marry him if he's already been married to another woman? Probably not. Most Christian churches wouldn't allow that. They'd call it adultery, another commandment broken. What's the difference between the unmarried couple and the married couple? Usually it's whether they've gone down to the courthouse to get hitched. And again, it's the political community that runs the courthouses, determines what's considered marriage and what isn't. Finally, and most strikingly, there is the commandment, thou shalt not kill. Now, other than extreme pacifists, there's no Christian who thinks that this means that killing as such is immoral. The traditional understanding is that it means thou shalt not murder. That's what the Greek or the Hebrew word means. Not all killing is murder. How about judges who assign the death penalty? Police officers who kill in the line of duty, soldiers who kill on the battlefield. Are they murderers? No, most Christians would say. Why not? The simplest answer would be because the law is on their side. The law not only permits, but commands them to kill in these situations. In fact, it's the law of our political community that determines who is a police officer or judge or soldier. You can't just put on a uniform and start dispensing justice. You need legal sanction. Now, some Christians would try to say the law isn't the real issue here. Why not just say murderers are people who kill voluntarily. They want to kill. Whereas judges and police officers and soldiers, they only kill unwillingly. They only kill when they're forced to. What does it mean to say they're forced to? They're forced by their civic obligations. So those do turn out to be pretty important after all. Or you could also try to say, well, as a Christian, you know, the really important thing isn't your actions. The, what matters is the intentions behind your actions. Purity of heart is what really matters. But what is the right intention for a soldier on the battlefield? Not to kill? Can you really say that you don't intend to kill your enemy when you're pointing a gun at him and shooting him? No, the rightful intention is to kill only in a just cause. Or only, again, when your civic duty compels you to, or back them to civic duty once again. Civic duty excuses and even justifies actions that, if taken for any reason other than civic duty, would potentially be mortal sins in the eyes of a Christian. I don't at all mean to say that in cases like these, Christians should just assume that they have a civic obligation to obey whatever their community and its laws tell them to do. Augustine does think that, in fact, as many of us do tend to assume that, but usually we also give some justifications for our community's laws. We distinguish between just and unjust laws. How, then, do we draw that distinction? 
let me stick to murder for now because I think it's the hardest and, and most revealing case. We permit, all of us permit, I think, the killing of enemy soldiers. And we know that many of them are not bad people. But we allow them to be killed. We say you do not have to go to confession for killing them if you're fighting for a just cause. What is a just cause? You could say self-defense is always just. The problem is that nobody really thinks that. Even if you disagreed with the Iraq War in 2003, was anybody really willing to say that Saddam Hussein was fighting in a just cause because he was fighting in self-defense of his country? It's very hard to say that. The reason being that self-defense for our country is not simply self-defense of the individuals who live in that country. Self-defense for a country is primarily defense of the regime or constitution of that country. Saddam's army was not fighting to keep every Iraqi alive. They were fighting to keep Saddam in power so that he could go on killing Iraqis. Every war is in some way a defense of a community's regime or way of life. And some regimes or way of life, ways of life are more worth defending than others. And so when we draw these common sense distinctions between a policeman and a murderer, a soldier and a murderer, a general and a mass murderer, and we say that one has offended God and the others haven't, we take for granted a whole political way of life, a whole system of laws and structure of power, rulers and ruled, that policemen, soldiers, and citizens are committed to defend by force if necessary. Christians, as much as anyone else, are willing to say the justice of that system, of that regime, as the six of us in this department, I think, would all call it, the justice of that regime justifies not absolutely any action you could possibly take to defend it, but many actions, such as killing, that would be gravely immoral if they were taken for any other reason. Christians, as much as anyone else, are willing to say, and I think are compelled to say if they're honest with themselves, that moral uprightness in the eyes of God demands devotion to a particular type of political community, namely a just community. Christians, it seems to me, cannot avoid saying that God himself demands devotion to such a community, if you're in one. A devotion that extends even to the use of physical force against the enemies of that community, or at least material support for soldiers who do use such force, soldiers and others. Now, what type of community is that? What makes a regime worth dying and killing for? That is not a question I intend to answer here. Although I would say, more or less as I closed last semester, every single course we teach in the politics department is in some way about that question. I do mean to say here that Christians can't avoid that question. If they think about what they themselves believe, it seems to me, Christians are forced to admit that virtue as they understand it is civic virtue, or at least can't be understood apart from it. Thank you. about what the founders thought about the privileges of citizenship, the rights of citizenship, and, and, our, and our experience of studying the founders, both, um, both here at UD and just sort of popularly, we think of the founders as being about rights. And that's generally true. Uh, but I think the way the founders talked about citizenship uh, and its rights indicated a moral purpose to rights that uh, suggested and sometimes it was more than a suggestion that there are corresponding virtues of citizenship. So the, the title of this brief talk is the, uh, the Privilege of Citizenship and Its Corresponding Virtues. Frequently, it's alleged, rightly so, that the founders were um, heavily influenced by the thought of, of John Locke. And Locke is generally thought, I, I think rightly so, to, uh, to have a certain individualist philosophy. I think it's fair to say that his emphasis is on the, the individual, on the individual's uh, 
right, the individual's right to consent or withhold consent. For Locke, when discussing the sort of primordial rights of life, liberty, and estate, he uses the word property as the paradigmatic right, which suggests that the, the paradigmatic form of human flourishing is, is individual. What about the American founders? Well, as you, as you may know, in, in scholarship among historians and, and political philosophers or political theorists, uh, a frequent topic of discussion is to what extent were the American founders individualists and to what extent were they communitarians? To what extent did they, um, were they interested in the, in the republic as a common good or to what extent were they uh, interested in vindicating the rights of loosely connected uh, individuals who are free individually to pursue individually each one his or her own happiness as he or she understands it. I think that uh, debate is, is very important and uh, I'm not here to resolve it, but I would like to just say a few things about what the founders said about citizenship and its privileges. Because I think that the, uh, the founders' conception of citizenship as embodying individual rights which had public purposes serves to resolve some of this tension between individualism and communitarianism in the founders' thought. Where did the founders get their ideas? Let's start with where they get their ideas from and what that, what that meant in terms of what, how they thought of the privileges and maybe even the virtues of citizenship. Where did they get their ideas about rights of citizenship or membership? Well, one major source was the English tradition, common law statutory laws of England. The founders used the word citizen after the Republican Revolution as an analog to the English term subject, which for Blackstone he distinguished from, a, there was aliens and there were an intermediate category called denizens and there was a third category, subjects. Um, so for instance, in granting Congress the power to admit aliens to citizenship, they used the word naturalization, to naturalize, which Blackstone indicated was the power to make aliens into subjects and to give them the rights of subject, subjecthood. Something that Parliament exercised under the British Constitution, but Congress should under the American. Another obvious source for the founders' ideas of citizenship is ancient Greek and Roman practice and speech, law, action of all sorts, verbal, legal, etc. Um, and in this respect, the founders' republicanism had a, had a, had a subconsciously neoclassical character to it. Um, indeed, in, in drafting their constitution, they included a phrase, that, um, a, a clause that I'm very familiar with, it was my dissertation topic, the Privileges and Immunities Clause, which Alexander Hamilton called the very basis of the whole union. And the clause said that the citizens of each state shall be entitled to all privileges and immunities of citizens in the several states. And by using all of these words, privileges, immunities, citizens, they use words that to Americans of that generation were obviously of Latin origin, not Saxon origin. Um, they didn't use the word rights. They talked about privileges and immunities. But how do we know of this classical connection? Well, we know that in the founding era and well through the 19th century, uh, among educated Americans, a small minority, education in both classical history and languages was compulsory. And um, various studies indicate this. Um, and there's a helpful study that was made recently uh, by Carl Richard in a book called The Golden Age of the Classics in America, where he did a survey of all of the, the admissions requirements for not only the sort of traditional universities, Harvard and Yale, but also the new colleges. And nearly all of them required significant proficiency in Greek and Latin uh, as a condition for admission in the, in the early 19th century. And he did a study of textbooks that had world history in 1860. And for good or for bad, over one fourth of the pages in those world history textbooks were devoted to Greek and Roman history. A small corner of the world, a small corner of world history, but from the standpoint of a lot of 18th and 19th century Americans, really just the important parts. <laughs> the Greeks and the Romans. Um, finally, we know this because um, we know we can see the classical or the neoclassical uh, sensibilities because in discussing citizenship and its privileges, citizenship and its rights, uh, 
frequent, many members of the founding generation, again, well into the 19th century, would say, well, first of all, we know at Roman law, citizens were this. Uh, Attorney General Bates, in a famous um, opinion of his, written in the 1860s on citizenship, complained about this. He said, everybody seems to be always citing the Romans. I'm not sure if it's any good, but they all do it. Um, so, so although that was, that's a critical commentary, it's also a commentary that reveals the widespread use of references to what they at least thought were um, Roman conceptions in particular of, of what citizenship was and what it meant. What were some of these rights of, of rights of subjecthood or rights of Roman citizenship? Again, I don't, I don't wish to say that the founders had it right on Roman history. I'm just saying what their book said at the time. I can, I can say something about what they thought about Roman, um, uh, Roman practice. Um, I'm not aware that what they thought was wrong, but at, at the same time, uh, I, don't, I don't pretend to have much of an, a good knowledge of, of Roman law. Well, let's begin with the, the English examples. Uh, Blackstone lists a number of rights that belong to subjects, not aliens, but only, only subjects. Uh, he talks about the right to enter and remain in the territory of the kingdom. A, a member of the kingdom has a right to the territory. He mentions the right to engage fully in the economic activity, the right to acquire, hold, and transfer real as well as personal property, freedom from special taxes that might be imposed on aliens, alien duties, alien taxes, and political rights, the right to elect and be elected to the House of Commons. From other sources, the founders would have known, for example, per the English Bill of Rights, that subjects, but not necessarily aliens, have a right to petition the king, and that subjects, who are Protestants, but not all other persons, have a right to bear arms. From Roman law, a somewhat similar set of rights could be found. Uh, um, classicists of the early 19th, late 18th, early 19th century, identified certain private rights that belonged to citizenship, including, again, the right of commerce, also the uh, freedom from special taxes, that might be imposed on uh, aliens, even native aliens of the, of, the, of the Republican Empire, the right to intermarry with citizens, uh, the, the jus canubi, as it was called, and also various public rights, like the right to right of suffrage and the right to the honors and offices of the Republic. From all these various sources and, and things that I, uh, you, you can read, especially the state constitutions, you get a... Uh, a fairly consistent conception in the founding generation of what membership in the American Republic looks like. The right to participate, and I, and I, I use these, these categories are mine, uh, in an effort to connect, in an effort to discuss these privileges in terms of the sovereignty of the people. First, the right to participate in the territorial sovereignty. That is, the right to stay in and remain, if you wish, in the territory of the United States. Everyone has a right to emigrate per lot, and a lot of the state constitutions said so. But you don't have to have a right to stay in. So a lot of the state constitutions would say, no citizen shall be banished, um, but that all persons have a right to leave. A right further to participate fully on a non-discriminatory basis in the economic activity of the community, right to acquire a portion of the, of the territory and identify it as your own, and a right to generally engage equally in the acquisition uh, holding and transfer of real as well as personal property. Another right that might be called, uh, was somewhat, somewhat marginal, and I'll explain that in a second, is right to participate in the procreative sovereignty of the people. That is the right to, that is the right to make new citizens, to enter marriages, the issue of which would be ipso facto citizens, even if they were born outside the, United, outside the territory of the United States. Um, I mentioned that's, that's somewhat marginal because, as uh, as Bacon mentioned, uh, Bacon mentioned in a, um, in, a, in, a, in, a in a letter he wrote in defense of the the union of the two kingdoms of England and Scotland, uh, the, the ancient Roman right of jus canubi is something we don't think about because in the Christian era, generally nations inter international marriages are accepted and encouraged. We don't have many rules of endogamy that prevent. Uh, individuals from marrying across lines of kingdom or nationality. Still, um, I think there, I, I found some evidence to indicate there's still some residual sense that citizenship would uh, give one the right of intermarriage. The right to participate in the coercive sovereignty of the people, the right to bear arms. 
on behalf of oneself and the community. The right to participate in the deliberative sovereignty of the people. Freedom of speech, press, assembly, petition. Now of these rights, arms and these deliberative rights, the communicative privileges, if you look at the state constitutions from the founding era, these rights are almost invariably associated with the word citizens or the people. And that's sharply distinguished from those provisions that deal with the right of religious freedom or the right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Those are human rights that are generally identified with human beings. Human nature itself gives them. But the right to actually come in and, well, again, bearing arms um, and the right to have a full participation in, this, in the political uh, speech of the community, uh, the deliberative sovereignty, and I'm, I'm, deliberate, I'm deliberately invoking uh, Aristotle there, um, is, is something the founders generally spoke of in terms of citizenship. And uh, to, to anticipate the discussion of the progressives, we today don't speak of speech as a privilege of citizenship. And a new, a new term of, of virtual neologism, which has become ubiquitous, is this idea of freedom of expression. Now, the right of expression is not, is, is the right, you could do it, as I told, I told my students, you could do it screaming obscenities in the forest by yourself. Uh, but for the founders, the freedom of speech is, the paradigmatic form of speech is the speech of the Republican citizen. Whereas for us, increasingly, it's the, it's the expression of the misunderstood artist. Uh, and I think, uh, I think it's fair to say the progressives have a very different conception of the people themselves um, and what, they, what their role is from the founder. Um, and finally, the right to participate in the decisional sovereignty of the people, that is to say the right to make the decisions of who is to be elected, what laws are to be made, what judgments are to be issued in a, in a discrete case or controversy. Um, this set of privileges, unlike the previous ones, are rights that were reserved only to a, a, a segment of the citizenry, and even today we only reserve it to a segment of the citizenry. We discriminate on the basis of age and residence in terms of whether one has a right to engage in these, these type of privileges. They famously or infamously also restricted it on the basis of, of, of sex. Uh, the other rights, however, travel, economic activity, speech, press, bearing arms, were not subject to these types of discriminations. The only, the only laws, to my knowledge, that, that existed uh, were designed to reflect, in a very uh, rough and ready way, that national disabilities, so for example, you, you would define by law when somebody has sufficient independence of thought to enter a contract, even though those, the, the age discrimination is always going to be very ham-handed. And more controversially, what I would call contractual disability, married women surrendered by free contract, rightly or wrongly, the right to independent control, uh, in independent property act activity. Now, were there any corresponding virtues to all of this? Well, I think if you think of all of these things as, as rights that individuals enjoy and exercise as members of the community, um, there is a sense in which each of, these, each of these privileges of citizenship is going to have a corresponding virtue. Uh, economic liberty, acquisition, holding, transfer of property, is, is acquisitive activity. Uh, I, think it, I think the founders, I'm, I'm certain the founders, believed that a self-governing citizen with these type of rights should have a certain degree of independence, intelligence, um, we might even say cleverness, in dealing with and, and, and managing their own property. The right to bear arms. Well, the Second Amendment already includes some sense of this, this, this purpose of arms. It's to secure a free state, and so it should be well regulated. And I would submit to you, when the founders thought of well-regulated militia, they weren't thinking of a control on the violence. They were thinking of a more effective use of violence. Regulated, so it would make it a more potent force against tyranny. Speech and press. I'm going to make a few comments about this and leave it at that. Um, this, I did a recent paper on the founders' deliberative virtues. But if you look at the Federalist Papers, and you look into the anti-federalist major writings, you see that both sides share a fairly common approach to political deliberation. First, confidence. Confidence in the inquiry that political speech should be robust and open and true because the more you talk, the more enlightenment there might be. That the, and, and so both federalists and anti-federalists do not blush to say, our goal is to find truth and refute error, and we can do it. The second confidence is in confidence in the people themselves. 
And although the Federalist Papers has a famously sober account of human nature, there are several important passages in which the founders are pretty emphatic that we think pretty highly of human nature, as a matter of fact. And we think that a people, especially this Anglo-American people that we've got, can actually speak and speak well among themselves. Again, there is a portion of virtue and honor among mankind which may be a reasonable foundation of confidence, said the Federalist. And the Republican theory of government presupposes the existence of these qualities in a higher degree than any other theory. So when you have this confidence in human speech, confidence in, in the many, in their capacity to deliberate, Federalist is directed explicitly to the people in the state of New York, that's the audience, not you, a few other smart people that we might know, but don't let the others in on the conversation. Candid. That word shot up over and over again. It's in bold in Federalist 1. Candor, openness, telling it like it is, keeping it real. <laughs> it's something that over and over, and both sides accuse the other of not being open. Uh, I'm going to leave it at that because there's, uh, there are some counteracting virtues they mentioned, including moderation and speech and a certain charity, which they do mention, but it's, it's, it's far less emphasized than the virtues. Um, so I guess just to sum up, looking at the founders, thinking in terms of their individual rights, what do they think about the right to speak or the right to bear arms? I think the more you look at what they had to say about it, they, they understood these rights to be, yes, rights that to be managed at, at, the, at the choice and the discretion and the reason of the individual, but in a manner, that, uh, the, the very definition of the rights themselves and the persons who were, enjoy them, who were to enjoy them reflected a, uh, should we say a communitarian, uh, approach to these rights. All, the, the paradigmatic individual with respect to these rights is a citizen in a community. Thank you. Of transformation of civic virtue. It's been observed that John Locke, the man who more than any other deserves to be called the founding father of the American Revolution, advances a teaching on political life which devalues or depreciates the relative dignity of the political association vis-a-vis -vis the classical understanding. The turn of the 20th century progressive movement agreed with this assessment of the social compact theory and sought to replace it with a new and exalted conception of the state, the German idea of the state. According to the progressives, the state ultimately achieves its proper end by promoting not only the fullest possible development or perfection, a term the progressives did not blanch using, uh, but also of the world. In other words, the progressives, the architects of the 20th century welfare state, did indeed seek to promote a welfare state, but one in the fullest possible sense of the term. In redefining the aim of government in this way, moreover, the progressives not only consciously and profoundly transformed the legitimate scope of the legislative power of government, but also, accordingly, the very virtues of its citizenry. In laying this transformation out, perhaps it would be useful to summarize the relevant points of Locke's social compact theory the theory which is manifestly distilled in the Declaration of Independence and many other public documents of the founding period. As Locke presents it, men consent to establish a body politic for a specific reason. And we have the first quote. Uh, 
The reason why men enter into society, he explains in the second treatise, is the preservation of their property. And the end why they choose and authorize a legislative is that there may be laws made and rules set as guards and fences to the properties of all members of society. Even if we note the expansive sense in which Locke uses the term or defines the term property, a term encompassing not merely the physical goods to which one might have an exclusive claim, but uh, the lives, liberties, and estates of men, Locke is plainly not defining the end of government, the appropriate object of the legislative power, in terms of man's highest good or perfection. Rather, as Peter's My Peter Myers notes in his commentary on Locke's thought, for Locke, quote, government functions most visibly as a means to protect private interests and liberties. Now, given this end, law, for Locke, has a fundamentally defensive, or what the progressives called, a negative purpose. In other words, the purpose of the law is not to direct its members, the members of the political community, to their own highest or best life, but more modestly, merely to secure its members' lives, liberties, and estates, chiefly by restraining those who would interfere with their exercise. This is why Locke likens legislating to building fences, just as a landowner builds a fence to establish a barrier to keep others out, and thereby secure the use of his land for himself, so the legislative power should set down laws to, quote, demarcate the boundaries of our property, and to protect those properties against others, as Peter Myers again. In a Lockean commonwealth, then, the law has a defensive function, because it is designed to prevent one's neighbors from arbitrarily interfering with one's natural right to make decisions in his own life. On this understanding of the purpose of government, then, the revolutionary naval slogan, don't tread on me, makes perfect sense. So too does Publius's celebration in Federalist 57 of the vigilant and manly spirit which actuates the people of America, a spirit which nourishes freedom and in return is nourished by it. If this spirit shall ever be debased, if the people ever cease keeping a watchful eye on their government, or fail to insist it constrain its power within its proper limits, Publius warns, <laughs> they, quote, will be prepared to tolerate anything but liberty. Now, the turn of the 20th century progressive movement, the vital core of which was a group of German-trained American academics and their students, regarded this wary defensive disposition that Publius praises as an anachronism, a psychological vestige of a now obsolete understanding of the proper relationship between the individual and his government. Instead, they extol, quote, the idea of devotion to the state as a sacred duty of its citizen. The new patriot, as Charles Van Heys, the president of the University of Wisconsin at Madison explains, is he who willingly surrenders control over his life, liberties, and estates in whatever measure the good of the race may require. Indeed, as Van, Hy Van Heys pointedly notes, the exceptional degree of self-sacrifice once required of Americans in wartime was now expected of Americans at all times. And so here we have the second quote. Okay. In the days of 61 to 65, and, and this was uh, 1913, so clearly he's referring to the Civil War. Right? In the days of 61 to 65, a million men laid aside their personal desires and surrendered their individualism for the good of the nation. Now it is demanded that every citizen shall surrender his individualism, not for four years, but for life. That he shall think not only of himself and of his family, but of his neighbors, and especially of the unnumbered generations that are to follow. In a word, you might say, the progressives exchange don't tread on me or do tread on me. <laughs> Whatever can account for this change. It is frequently suggested today that the progressive reforms were merely a theoretical or pragmatic reaction to the changing social circumstances of post-Civil War America. In this telling, progressivism was a valiant effort to conserve fundamental American values in the face of economic and social changes threatening to subvert their realization. The problem with this interpretation is that the progressives were not seeking to conserve the principles of the social compact, but rather to replace them with what they regarded as a truer and nobler conception of the state, the German idea of the state. As Sylvia Fries has observed in a survey of uh, the, the origins of the American political science, which was founded uh, by progressive academics, she notes, uh, this is my third quote here, 
American political science was since its inception of the ages of Francis Lieber and until World War I, dominated by the German idea of the state. The state whose origin is in history, whose nature is organic, whose essence is unity, and whose ultimate end is the moral perfection of mankind. So American political science, like the other social sciences organized by progressive academics, was dominated by the German idea of the state. Richard T. Ely, the man who founded the American Economic Association in 1885, was one of the single most influential progressive economists. In an 1896 chapter entitled The State, Ely contrasts what he calls the state with the social compact theory of government, or as he has it, quote, that ignoble doctrine that the state is a necessary evil. Whereas social compact theory holds that the natural state of man is a state outside of government, Ely declares that the state is the natural condition of men. By this he means not merely that the state grows up naturally or spontaneously, as opposed to being the product of the will of men, or the product of consent, uh, but he also means this in its natural, in a teleological sense. Ely then invokes Aristotle as a guide in explaining the proper relationship between the individual and the state. And here we have quote number four. Aristotle described an order of development when he said the state was formed for the sake of life, but that it was continued for the sake of the good life. This means the state is necessary in order that men, man may live at all. Its first purpose was the provision of material resources for the nourishment of the animal life. But the higher, nobler purpose of the state is not the material life, but the soul and mind of man. As soon as the means of life are provided, we must aspire to the good life. So just as Aristotle teaches that man is by nature political, because he cannot live well or achieve his natural end outside of the polis, so Ely contends that the state is the natural condition of man. The state comes into existence for the sake of living, for the nourishment of the animal life, but continues for the sake of the soul and mind of man. For Ely, then, the ultimate aim of the state is to promote the, uh, the soul and mind of man, an aim he elsewhere defines in terms of the most perfect development of all human faculties in each individual, including, quote, all the higher faculties, faculties of love, of knowledge, of aesthetic perception, and the like. For Ely, then, the ultimate purpose of the state, and hence the guiding aim of his reforms, was, the, was to promote the comprehensive good or welfare of man. The progressives believe that this elevation of the aim or purpose of the state was only possible in an advanced stage of, of history, development, or social evolution, a point the reformers believed they were on the cusp of achieving in the United States of America. One consequence of this change would be that the law would shed its negative or defensive function of restraining others from interfering with the individual's exercise of his natural rights, and would turn positive, or uh, term they like to use, superintending or directional in character. It is no accident in this vein that the chapter following Ely's discussion of the state is entitled, Making Men Good by Law. Indeed, for Ely and the progressives, the law should step in or trespass, if you will, in whatever measure its obligation to promote a wider and deeper development of all human faculties was believed to require. In general, as Ely pointedly notes, quote, there is no limit to the right of the state, the sovereign power, save its ability to do good, end quote. Or as one social gospeler triumphantly declared in the context of, adv of it advocating that very progressive reform prohibition, and here we have the last point, Quote number five, personal liberty is at last an uncrowned throne king with no one to do in reverence. The social consciousness is so far developed and is becoming so autocratic that the institutions and governments must give heed to its mandate and shape their life accordingly. We are no longer frightened by that ancient bogey, paternalism in government. We affirm boldly, it is the business of government to be just that, paternal. Nothing human can be foreign to a true government. For the progressives, while some Americans would have to be more thoroughly subjected to public supervision than others, every American was nonetheless expected to assume the same passive posture of surrender. In this, of course, the progressives were merely expecting their less morally developed fellow Americans to obey 
an arrangement men having grown fully moral or social would voluntarily embrace. For the man whose social capacity, the capacity for love, as Ely calls it, had reached its terminal degree of development, or for a man whose social capacity, his capacity for love, as Ely calls it, um, which had reached its terminal degree of development, would realize that his own highest good or welfare lay in promoting the fullest possible welfare of others. As such, his life, liberty, and state, apart from being used for this purpose, had no real value. As Charles McCarthy, an Ely student who was the original organizer of the Wisconsin Legislative Reference Library, library sums up the progressive view. Here's the last quote. One of the, the two books written on the brilliant progressive reforms uh, established in the state of Wisconsin, even the students with the heart. He writes, if there is a magnificent building built in any city which is not either directly or indirectly for the purpose of improving the opportunities and increasing the happiness of all the men of the country, it is built for no purpose and were better not in existence. This the German knows. This the American secures still in the mighty phrases of the Declaration of Independence glorying in the tarnished grandeur of the Constitution, boasting of his riches and the power and might of his material things has not yet discovered. Our civilization, with its wealth and prosperity, must be made to exist for its true purposes, the betterment, the efficiency, the welfare of each individual. The Germans have shown us of what of the way. We need not adopt all their methods, but we will do well to accept their philosophy, for there is no patent on it. Now, whether the progressive reforms actually had the effect of cultivating such super patriots, or rather serve to but sap the modest virtues of a lot of the commonwealth, is the subject, I think, of a different talk. Thank I should have said this at the outset. We'll have a question and answer period afterwards, and then there is a reception across the hall, but we're not allowed in there until 6 o'clock. So I'm going to talk for a long time. <laughs> no, I, I, I want to get to question and answer as soon as we can. Okay, one of the important questions that Aristotle raises in his politics is the question of the relationship between the good man and the good citizen. Good citizenship is, of course, he argues, going to be relative to any regime that one happens to find oneself in. A democracy will want its citizens to be committed to democracy. An oligarchy wants to have them committed to the oligarchic presupposition. This will then likely produce good citizens. But the qualities or the virtues that make one a good man are not relative to any particular regime but seem instead to transcend the regime. So the virtue of the good man does not depend on the commitment of the regime, but rather on living the life of virtue. Thus, the initial conclusion we take away from Aristotle is that the good man and the good citizen are not identical. The good citizen in a corrupt or defective reg regime will be defective, and the good man will be a good citizen only in a good regime. I'll come back to that uh, later. G.K. Chesterton, in his work, What I Saw in America, remarks that prior to disembarking his ship in an American port in the 1920s, he was asked to fill out a form which contained queries about a number of things, trying to ferret out information about his status and his reasons for visiting. One of the questions that amused him on the form was the question of whether or not he was an anarchist whose intention was to overthrow the government. You have to answer yes or no. His response was to note that, of course, if that was his intention, he would never answer the question honestly. 
But the question gets asked in America, he suggests, because America is unlike most any other country. For one thing, uh, any anarchist would willingly lie about his purposes, but Americans, he says, expect people to tell the truth. Secondly, he noted, America is a peculiar country in that it is a collection of people of varied backgrounds united under a common impulse, but not by the traditional marks of unity in society. Or we might ask, what are those traditional marks of unity in a society? On this point, we might think about a statement made by Publius in Federalist II, uh, in which he says this, with equal pleasure, I have as often taken notice that Providence has been pleased to give this one connected country to one united people, a people descended from the same ancestors, speaking the same language, professing the same religion, attached to the same principles of government, very similar in their manners and customs, and who, by their joint councils, arms, and efforts, fighting side by side throughout a long and bloody war, have nobly established general liberty and independence. Now, this claim by Publius can't possibly be true, or at least not entirely accurate. It seems instead to be at odds with the evidence we have about America in 1776, or as he's writing in 1787. Surely there is some unification of background, ancestry, religion, and language, but it surely was not wholly unified. Indeed, one might say, we see, seem to have been characterized then, as we are now, by some degree of multiplicity and variety. Indeed, as, Je as, as, as Chesterton pointed out a century ago, America has nationalities at the end of the street that the British, at his time, find only at the end of the world. And yet, I think one might say, given that multiplicity that we found in America and still find in America, we still can and do acknowledge that there is something peculiar to being an American. Uh, and here I'll just rely on an example that uh, uh, some of you know of. Uh, Peter Schramm, who teaches at Ashland in Ohio, gave a talk here many years ago, which he has since uh, published, uh, in which he tells the story of his family leaving Hungary. Uh, in the uh, Soviet crackdown in the 50s. And he says his, his father gathered the family together and told them, uh, we're leaving and we're going to America. And he said, well, Dad, why are we going to America? We, we know people in other places. We could go to England. There's lots of places we could go. Why are we going to America? And he said his father's response was, because we were born Americans in the wrong country. This is a unique claim. I think, that America does make, and rightly makes, that one can become an American. Right? Try to become French. They won't let you. <laughs> but one can become an American, no matter where or when one was born. And yet there's more to it than that. And part of it has to do with what our citizens uh, know uh, including what they know about their political order. So here, let me say something about our contemporary understanding of our, of our own situation. Uh, there was a recent study published, a five-year uh, study done of the American public's knowledge of the United States Constitution. The 33-question exam, uh, the, the average score for Americans was 54%. Worse than that, Elected public servants were given the same questions. They scored 49%. <laughs> so 49%, for example, of elected officials in America that, that took the survey, only 49% could name the three branches of government. Only 46% knew that Congress, not the president, has the power to declare war. This actually, I think, is a misleading question. Uh, I got it right when I took the quiz, but only because I guessed that it was misleading. Congress doesn't have the authority to declare war. They have the, the authority to pass a declaration of war, but it has to be signed by the president. It's just in the same way Congress exercises all of its other powers, or most of its other powers. So, in any case, a misleading question. 
Uh, but only 15% of elected officials were aware that the phrase a wall of separation does not appear in the Constitution. 20% of elected officials thought that the Electoral College was an actual school. Uh, some other, now this, these are responses not from uh, elected officials, but rather just sort of random responses that were given uh, to the uh, questions. Uh, some people did think that the Constitution was written in France. Uh, more than one thought the first ten amendments to the Constitution were called the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, and some thought that the rights one of the rights guaranteed by the First Amendment is the right to freedom from fear. Well, they're just good students of FDR. Uh, when, uh, back when I first started teaching many years ago, I used to give uh, bonus questions on, on exams. And one of the questions I, I often gave was, is this passage in the Constitution, to each according to his need, from each, from each according to his ability? A lot of students said yes, it was in there. So I, did, I didn't give them the, the credit until one student wrote on there, yes, it's in there, it's the, that's the income tax. I gave them the credit. Pretty close. One, one time I had a student write on it, uh, I was educated in the 60s by Catholic nuns, I know it came from Marx. <clears throat> well, perhaps it's, it's not that important. Uh, that citizens, general citizens, not elected officials, don't know so much about the Constitution. Uh, Wilmore Kendall uh, used to routinely point out that it's not that important that the people know what the Constitution says or what's contained in particular phrases, as long as they know it in their hips. But it is important that our cultural and certainly our intellectual elites know something about the Constitution. But when they reject it, or they downplay the significance of the Constitution, that fact alone will likely undermine the attachment of the people to the Constitution. But we, we must all recognize, I think, the necessity of Americans being familiar with at least the basic public teachings, political teachings of their own civic order. But how do we go about doing that? How do we go about improving the student's grasp of American politics, history, and society. Well, we have employed various methods of educating our citizenry uh, throughout our history uh, about our political system. Uh, and some of those approaches uh, have been implemented, and some have obviously been more successful than others. I'll give you one example of that. Uh, in the early 20th century, a concerted effort was made to educate immigrants as they moved towards citizenship. In response to the concern that immigrants would not know much about America and thus would not easily become full-fledged members of their communities, the government devised patriotic catechisms of sorts, which would give the would-be citizens some assistance in preparing themselves to pass what they would have to eventually pass is their citizenship test. Uh, so let me give you, it's a wonderful work by Michael Kamen, K-A-M-M-E-N, titled The Machine That Would Go of Itself, The Constitution in American Culture. And Kamen talks about some of these uh, uh, catechisms, which he describes as, and they, they would have questions such as this. Uh, what is the term of a senator? What's the highest court in the United States, etc.? And then he says, there, was a, there were expected responses, right? So they, they gave them to you. So you were, the question, a question was, who rules in a republic or a democracy? The expected answer was, the people through their chosen representatives, right? this sort of thing. But he also goes on to record the fact that the respondents' answers uh, that were actually given were not always exactly what was anticipated, as we can see from some of the record files that have been maintained. So here, uh, this is just from a, 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 a gathering of answers that were given. One question, what powers does the federal government have over the various states? The answer, the one that was actually given, red, blue, and white. Question, name the three branches of U.S. government. Answer, deduction, reduction, I don't know third. Question, ever hear of the Constitution? Yes. What is it? Name of ship or boat? That? Uh, uh, who, uh, uh, let's see, others, uh, um, uh, what, what else have you learned about this government? It's so sort of a general answer. The answer, the executive branch, the sentimental, and the judicial. Question, do you know the meaning of the word sentimental? Answer, yes, 
That is the branch that explained the laws. Well, that's pretty much what they do. It's pretty much guided by sentiment. Um, and then, uh, uh, lastly, uh, what are the duties of the Vice President of the United States? Answer, I think he don't do much. <laughs> Question, what does he do? The most he does is sit around and smoke cigars. Uh, no, okay, well, uh, last, last point. Uh, name some of the important duties of a citizen. Answer, love your neighbor. It's not bad. A really good start for, for citizenship. But he ends with this. Uh, this is from, taken from a, a, an immigrant to Chicago, uh, expressing, Hammond says, a sentiment that so many petitioners must have shared. At the end of her examination, Goldie Sokoloff pleaded, please, mister, don't ask me any more questions, as I want to be a citizen and I don't know any answers. <laughs> Stop berating me. Now, this evidence, I think, is interesting for, in part for this reason that these are, these are responses that are given by people who had to answer the question in order to acquire citizenship. That, that is, here there was a real incentive to master these facts, and yet they often failed at it. That indicates, I think, how difficult the task of education to civic knowledge can actually be. But the fact that it's not easy to educate Americans, or frankly most people, doesn't mean that one should abandon the effort. That effort should be made, and indeed it must be made, though not on what might often appear as misguided grounds or principles. Uh, and here on this point, I'll quote just a passage from uh, President Reagan's farewell address, which he said this, we've got to teach history based not on what's in fashion, but what's important. If we forget what we did, we won't know who we are. I am warning of the eradication of the American memory that could result ultimately in an erosion of the American spirit. Okay, to connect this back to my opening comments about Aristotle. Aristotle asserts that the promotion of virtue, whether true virtue or the virtue of a citizen, is the function of law. Because men are moved to act, at least in part, by force and fear, we need law as a prompt to right action. But we have to ask whether we see the function or purpose, that, that purpose or function of law in the same way. Certainly the contemporary tendency is to reject that idea. That is, that law might forcefully lead one to the life of virtue. Yet, if law does not compel me to act virtuously, even if it's a defective understanding of virtue, what does it compel me to do? Because it is obviously compelling me. It compels me all the time. To the extent it compels one to do anything, of course, it is promoting a conception of virtue or a conception of the moral life. So we have to ask a further question then is, do we actually think of the law as coercive? And if so, do we connect that coercion to the obligations and actions of citizenship? That is, do we take law to be performing the function of producing citizens, a certain character in our citizens? Perhaps we undervalue the relationship between the good man and the good citizen. That is, in light of the principles at the foundation of the American political order, we might ask whether we consider it necessary or even desirable for one to take seriously political matters and an understanding of an attachment to the political order. For example, to what extent do we reserve particular honors in America for those who have committed themselves to lives of excellence in the public sphere? Or do we sufficiently or adequately honor those who have committed themselves to the regime? Now, of course, the moment we raise the question of honor, giving honors to some and not to others, we put ourselves in something of a difficulty. For the democratic impulse, certainly the contemporary democratic impulse, may very well militate against honoring anyone. After all, if we're all fundamentally equal, what could possibly justify honoring one person over another? Isn't there a general difficulty in honoring people in democracy? Honor in the modern world has something of a controversial character to it for a multiplicity of reasons. 
It often presents itself as hubris or pretentious great soldness. It appears in some to be motivated by some form of self-interest. And in Christian thought, it appears often to be at odds with the emphasis on humility that has certainly been a dominant strain of the Christian tradition. In public life, as Tocqueville, among others, has indicated, the question of honor is further complicated by this predominance of the passion for equality, a principle which, on the surface, seems to be at odds with the distinctiveness typically associated with those deemed worthy of honor. And I should say, Tocqueville, of course, distinguishes between and among different kinds of equality. And, and he says uh, the, the kind that doesn't recognize the capacity and, and need for uh, honor is a degraded form. But in the end, we might be led to ask whether democracy, though seemingly hostile, at least contemporary democracy, seemingly hostile to the marks of distinction merited by honorable citizens and their honorable actions, is not still fundamentally dependent upon the presence of such leaders to sustain itself. If it is, that is, if it is dependent on the presence of such leaders, then it needs to provide an arena for displays of honor and perhaps provide as well a breeding ground for preeminent characters. The question for democracy then is whether the formation and construction of citizens and citizenship can sufficiently point in the direction of promoting a particular set of goods and principles, which can be understood to be compatible with and indeed supportive of a flourishing moral universe. That is, how do we go about sustaining a robust moral order within the framework of the contemporary political order? That, I take it, is largely our task. mentioned that the, the progressives were interested in a paternalistic approach to government. Um, I wanted to know if it would be fair to say, and I, this is related to my comment about freedom of expression, two things. First of all, unlike, unlike a genuinely paternal role, the goal is not to create a temporary school, but it's a permanent, subordin a support, a permanent uh, subordination. Paternalism is meant to be, if you're being a fatherly affection is the goal is to not be doing that <laughs> in that way so that, so that um, and the second thing is um, to what extent do these the impression I had and I um, was that the progressives in thinking of the people that they're trying to make better tend to not think of the people at large as as the critical rational agents in their own self-government. What I mean by that is there's all this focus on movement, on sub-rational things that the people do. They have movements. They, they, they engage in demonstrations. They, um, they express. Whereas uh, this isn't simply an integration of manner. This is a, a sub-rational character that's to the people. It's imposed, but it's not imposed, but it's attributed to the people. And the reason, the rationality of the, of the state is going to be monopolized in those with scientific knowledge. Does that strike you as, as accurate, Sarah? Yeah. Well, I think two things. Um, the first thing uh, so uh, your first question, are you asking whether they, did they view paternalism as ultimately um, removing the kind of paternal role for government by the elevation of its citizens, or did they view them as basically permanent subjects? Permanent subject, yeah. Right. Um, in their understanding of history, in their understanding of human development, um, 
they saw themselves as um, kind of on the leading edge, having a keener insight as well as a more highly uh, developed social consciousness by which the power of government would become the agent of everyone else's moral progress. So elevate those who you can. They were not confident that you could elevate all of humanity. Um, they were willing to recognize um, that they thought that there were certain, there were certainly advanced races and there were there was a, a long line of more or less um, primitive races and they are talking about the possibility of there may even be inferior races who will basically always be subjects. Um, in, in terms of their, um, but they, 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 you know, kind of go back and forth in terms of progressives describe themselves as Democrats. Um, they, pop, they do more than anything else, I think, in American history to popularize the term. Um, and I think that, that part of that is coming from the expectation that, as I say, the, the state is the agent of moral progress, and so the elevation that they have attained, they're going to try to promote that uh, a comparable element, uh, elevation for those who are capable of it. So that's the object of their policy. Now, in, in terms of, the, of uh, um, so I think your second question is that kind of going to to what extent then would the people be engaged in the actual <coughs> exercise of the government? Well, it seems to me that what, what they promote is on the one hand a uh, what, what they promote is something like you know the, the popular referendum, the, the the opportunity for the for the people to to throw something up there. Which is very different from, say, um, um, it's very different from the people engaging in deliberation. You don't deliberate; you just say, "I want something." Um, my impression, again, when I look at the progressives, is it's their conception of what the people are supposed to do is very different. And, and maybe they would say it's super rational or sub rational, but it's the expression of what a spirit or a movement. And they say, "We want something." The reason, the rationality is, um, I mean, not monopolized, but it's largely in a scientifically educated elite. We'll do the governing. You tell us, you give us, your job isn't to come back and tell us how to make the soup. You say you're hungry, I want stuff. Our job, but, but, but stay out of the kitchen. Because this is where, this is where the, this is where the smart people do things. Yeah, no, so I think, uh, uh, to what extent did they actually see kind of a, a broader set segment of the people involved in governance. Because on the one side, they supported all of these direct democracy reforms, uh, the initiative, where you actually, as I like to tell my classes, having spent a, a great deal of time on um, passing the age of, of, of consent in the state of California, I've legislated before because I voted on the, on the initiative. Um, there's the referendum um, and direct primary and so forth. And so on the one hand, that looks like um, they did get involved. It's uh, uh, granted that uh, the initiative um, and the referendum do not lend themselves to a higher level of deliberation, but they do involve the people in the exercise of legislative power um, in, to one extent or another. Um, and, but I think all, it, it, that's not to deny um, that the, what the progressives thought, a, a, a crucial change in the, uh, the the uh, constitution of the legislative power of government, the kind of change, there was a, an essential change that would be necessary to actually produce the kind of policy that could solve the problems that were holding our advance back um, was the congressional delegation of power, which shifted the, you know, the overwhelming majority of the exercise of legislative power of government out of the hands of our representatives, much less the people. Um, and into the hands of, uh, of civil servants uh, who are, are remotely responsible for the people at the very best. And that's true. Um, one other aspect uh, that I, I think, and so, you know, and, and did they anticipate that that was going to be a, a temporary condition? I think they got, I can point to one or two who thought that um, that was kind of a, um, a temporary condition. John Dewey seems to think that that might be a temporary thing. Um, but I don't know in general that I would say that they did take that view, that that wouldn't be permanent. Um, and then there's also the aspect of, in, in terms of their notion of, of, um, of, of public service. And so you can think of public service in the terms of actually participating in the offices and engaging in, in the exercise of power in the government. Um, but there's also, they look for an elevation of the people. Um, 
I mean, in, in terms of their growing social consciousness, and they're willing to sacrifice for others um, on the battlefield in part, um, and probably uh, willing to do that, um, but also serving the public um, in, in other, um, not so obviously, um, not through, so obviously through government itself. Yes. Yeah, um, I just wanted to try and see what you thought about uh, the fact that though privileges and immunity seem to be something carried over from the English tradition, it's obviously not the same. There's some things on the list that you change, right? You, you don't have to be a Protestant on a firearm last time I checked, right? So, to what degree are these things? Stable, constant things that you can refer to when constitutional questions, you can always say that's not a correct interpretation because it's not a traditional interpretation of the religion in certain community. And to what extent does this kind of get transformed uh, rightly or wrongly? And is there a way to decide what kind of changes are acceptable uh, and who's the authority to do change? If I understand your question correctly, um, you're citing first the precedent that the, cha the changes have been made from, from uh, pre and before and after 1776. And secondly, to what extent can there be, in terms of interpreting the Constitution, a change, a similar change? Or is that the last, is that the last change you get to have? Right. I think, I think the answer is, the short answer is, the Constitution by identifying privileges and immunities of citizens in the several states, or privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States, makes an implicit um, reference to that revolution. The United States has a birthday. And as long as the United States doesn't, the people don't change their constitution, that um, um, citizenship and its privileges have a certain endurance. Um, whereas, because Constitutional and revolutionary, this is my claim, constitutional and revolutionary arguments are mutually exclusive. If something's revolutionary, it's not constitutional. 1776 is a revolution, establishment of, well, a united nation composed of many wholly republican regimes, and a larger one, as opposed to the constitutional monarchy that was there before. Um, Perhaps if you want to follow up and ask a follow-up question that can direct anything else I might want to say about this. There's a lot, there's a, obviously I, I could talk for months on this subject, so. Um. Uh, that seems to be a pretty simple answer that it's something that stops at the time of the founding. So if, if somebody was trying to make a claim that there's a new or transformative by understanding of what a privilege or immunity of citizenship is, then they have to defeat that kind of understanding where it's actually something that starts and stops and repeats. Well, if you want to see it in terms of a, a, not a normative but a descriptive thing, uh, you could make many claims. Uh, whether those things are, whether those are legitimate changes, is, is a different question. One, one sort of, um, I think it's an unconscious, in several sort of major changes in thought that have a, have a, um, an indirect and indi um, unintentional, unintentional effect on our understanding of citizenship and what it might mean in America. One is the, the American tendency in the 19th century is very generous toward non-citizens. So much so that a lot of these things I was talking about, like the right to acquire real estate. In 1790, everyone would have understood, what, is this, what, do, you get to, what do you get when you get to be a citizen? First thing that would have come to mind primarily is owning land. Um, because that was, a, that was a traditional disability of alienage. During the 19th century, more and more state constitutions include provisions that say we're not we're going to let aliens buy land here. We're not doing that anymore. Uh, 1793 Patent Act said that only citizens could acquire intellectual property in the United States. Um, would be to even propose that today would be, people would consider that crazy because in the 19th century, gradually all these restrictions are dropped, and so today we have our global marketplace. The United States is um, people, inventors from around the world try to acquire intellectual property rights in the United States, and it's considered you don't even have to pay necessarily a higher fee than, than a citizen does. Um, so one of the ways in which our generosity to alienate, aliens changes things, it does not expand the category, but makes it a more and more obscure what it means. Another instance of this is in, in the 1830s, uh, 
the Michigan Constitution was the first one to say that all persons have the right to bear arms, identifying persons instead of people and citizens. And it happened in the Michigan, Michigan was controversial and had a very generous constitution. Even aliens could vote, or at least people that had just you know, had begun the naturalization process. And I saw the moment, I looked at, there, there's uh, some, some records of the debates, and just one of the delegates says, well, why not? And so most constitutions after that point, the, the distinctions that are pretty consistent in 1789, it's just all persons. And, and part of the transformation also is the transformation of the idea of speech, press, assembly. I think partly under the, under the, uh, under the pressure from progressivism, which look at the demos, I mean, this is the hypothesis that I was bringing up and asking about, that the, the people's job is to be embody a spirit and a feeling. And so speech, speech is, becomes subsumed into a general idea of individual autonomous thought and, again, expression. And it's, it's Justice Brandeis, sort of one of these great progressives, who um, really, I, I, as far as I can tell, looking in the history, he kind of introduces that into the Supreme Court lexicon. And now that's how we talk about it in the law schools, freedom of expression, which um, obscures any kind of connection it might have with, with citizenship. Um, and uh, part of that also is through the, ex not just in, in American law, but also internationally. You look at the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citi uh, of Human Rights, there's no citizenship in there, except you have a right to be a citizen somewhere. But what that might mean, for the most part, is just any human being, no matter what, whether you're alien or citizen, you have lots of rights. And the more you expand the concept of human rights, and the more you, to that extent, the term citizenship and its privileges seems like, well, I guess you can vote. But even then, why, why, why would you limit it necessarily to, to citizens? Ultimately, the, the, the only privilege you have of citizenship is the right to use, I'm a citizen. That's the only thing that distinguishes a citizen from the alien is, is the name tag. Um, I'm not saying these are good, these are just like good or bad things, but they, they really, they, they're, I think, largely responsible for um, uh, our, to a certain extent, our, our looking at the American founders, and again, all the debate is just about individual community, individual community, man and the state. But this concept of citizenship is, uh, is becomes, as Robert Fork said, an inkblot in our Constitution, and I think in our, you know, generally our polity. Just a, just a quick clarification. You, you said the privilege and immunities clause marks a beginning point. Is that beginning point 1776 or 1787? So, 1776. Okay. And that's what um, I'm going to get to in my dissertation and everything else. I've been, I'm still obsessed with this topic. But yes, the sort of the most important, the most authoritative statement by a founder, Justice Bushrod Washington, who was a young founder, a nephew to George. I uh, was at the Virginia Ratifying Convention, and, and his definition was, these are the rights that belong to the citizens of all free governments in the manner they've been enjoyed in the several states since independence. Not since, and, and that's indicated in the Constitution as well, because um, to be a senator, a member of the House, you have to have been a citizen of the United States for nine and seven years respectively, which takes it well before 1787. If, if citizenship in, in the United States is born in 1787, then no one could have been in the House or Senate for you know, several years. Carl. Uh, also for Dr. Hall, uh, you mentioned the use of the American use of the term citizen as an analog of the British term subject, but I think that it's also uh, used as an antonym of subject. So I was wondering if you think there are any privileges, immunities, or virtues that the founders would think apply to citizens but not to subjects. Well, the founders would have looked at the British constitutional system as a free government of this, in the same genus, but not the same species as theirs. Because the British constitution already had a House of Commons so the, people, the people's representatives could consent, much as they had their own colonial assemblies that, that made their, their, they were always a free people. And, and the, one of the objections to the king is that he's trying to turn a free people into a, into a slavish people. Um, so in large measure, in large measure, there weren't any, there, um, anything radically different. All of it's kind of enhanced when you take whole, partly popular government and turn it into wholly popular government. Um, so for the founders, it's a conception of what a, what a free people under a government in which they have, their consent has to be registered. Um, so it would not be very different, but um, 
among the things that the American Revolution emphasizes is not only religious freedom, but also civic equality across religious faiths. So subjects who are Protestants, that doesn't appear in the American Constitution. It's all, all American subjects, all American citizens have a right to bear arms um, and participate in this. That's one thing that would be, would be novel. Uh, not so much the, the, the definition of the right, but the scope of it. There's a lot more that can be said, but... just the um, look at the Second Amendment where there's a purpose given to, this, to the right to bear arms. The, this, the, the right is pretty broad. It's all the people. But the purpose of it is um, um, uh, to, to preserve a self-governing people, which requires that the coercive power not be monopolized in a professional um, standing army, but that generally you have an armed citizenry. With respect to speech and press, a number of the uh, sort of statements or proposals, either proposals or, or otherwise, use similarly purposive, you know, statements. They'll say, uh, the citizens are supposed to present their best ideas. They're supposed to be there as a, as a censor on the, on the government, and they have a, a right and a duty to present their best, best understanding. It's a right that can only be exercised by the individual exercising with limited practical reason, but nonetheless is something that uh, they have a right to do it because they have a duty to the community to do it. The, um, at, the, at the Urban Public Library, there are two, they have a display on freedom of speech. And I, usually, I, I often cite this in my discussion as sort of founders versus progressives on speech. Two images. One is Norman Rockwell, freedom of speech. Town, the town meeting standing up. He's holding something, he's looked like he's red, leading discourse, logos. And then there's another image of somebody with a bullhorn shouting a protest, engaging in a de demonstration, which I, I take to be a, a, a sub-rational place for expressing demands. And it all depends on what you think is the, the sort of the, the sort of form of speech. Crusaders yes, the Crusaders for life. <laughs> 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 but in a good way, in a good way. They do, they do it okay. Burning the flag. Yeah, yeah, burning the flag. But even, so what are you doing there? You're, I guess in both cases you can say it's public spirited. You do your job by registering, by letting, letting the, the, the rulers know what the zeitgeist wants, because the people are the, de are the, are the vehicle for, for the expression of the spirit. Isn't there something, I mean, I agree with the president's view, uh, mostly the view, how most people participate in politics, but there's something that you I think vulgarity is a virtue. I'm going to say that provocatively. The vulgarity of the, of the Vulgate, of the people at large, is a virtue for sort of a certain kind of progressivism. Um, I can say more than that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, are, are you interested in, in 
where I thought you started was um, kind of asking about the fact to focus on individual rights, but yet he's, uh, Dr. Evans has been talking about um, And so where does the public spirited part come in? Is it public spirited? Is that where you're starting? Yeah, I mean, you guess that would be the critique. I guess the premise would be that the professors had something, you know, uh, really cared about all the spirit things. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know if that's true or not, but... Actually, I, I do think that's true. Yeah. You know, so, um, you know, just to give one example, um, you know, one, one of the most famous lines from a 20th century inaugural address was President Kennedy's, you know, uh, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. That's a perfectly progressive statement. Um, along the lines of which I, I laid out. But going back to the founders, um, you know, if, if you look at, I, I mentioned this quote from Federalist uh, 57, in which Publius is praising the, the vigilant and manly spirit of the people and saying that this is a spirit which nourishes freedom and is nourished by it. So it's, it's, these are obviously um, Qualities in which you know the vigilance is the individual keeping an eye on the government. You know, so this is kind of this is you know basically what Publius is saying. If this is going to work, folks, you can't just sink into your private concerns and pretend the public sphere doesn't exist. You have to be vigilant. You have to be informed. You have to be a, keep an eye on. And then when you espy those in government betraying their trust, you have to be manly in the sense in which you have to be willing to stand up and then call them on and say, this is not what we're putting in place to do. So does it have a self-interested group? Yes. Because your purpose in doing this is to secure, is to try to ensure that the government better secures your rights. But in the very process of doing that, the individual is kind of being pulled out of their private concerns and being more made more public-minded. Now, on the other side, the progressives uh, have this very resultant view of, of, of human character and of what's really the, the uh, a degree of devotion to others um, that's possible. And um, part of the way in which their reforms, their domestic policy reforms in the 20th century, are designed to create social conditions that would enable um, the United States to better cultivate the intellectual qualities and the social dedications of, of the American people. So in part, you know, to the extent to which you're really worried about making ends meet, that's going to kind of hem in your concern for others. And so one of the ways in which we can um, promote a fuller public concern is by creating programs that will diminish, um, that will help give you uh, more material abundance and so ease that concern. They, the idea being this will help form a more social minded person. Um, that, I think, was their genuine aspiration. Um, whether those programs actually do that is a very different question. Well, I just want to add to that, actually, because uh, I think there is a, uh, another element here, and that is, I think that the, there's a practical and a, and a principled reason why that appeal uh, to, uh, to, to that active citizenship, uh, thinking in terms of uh, facing one, one, one's uh, connection with the political order on, on, the, on the defense of, of natural rights, why that gets, why that gets changed. There's a practical reason for it. Practical reason it seems to me is that um, once you develop a body of law and precedents, etc., um, it seems like, like there's less need to constantly go back to first principles and say, okay, but my natural right is X. And so you begin to think of rights, say, protected under the Bill of Rights or something like that. And so there's a, there's a practical reason for that. And it seems to me that that's some, there's something, there is something desirable about that. It is it promotes a kind of stability uh, as a consequence. The defect, of course, is it might bury the very principle uh, that, that is the basis of the, of the precedence. So I, I think there's a practical reason for 
from sort of dying away of, of natural rights argument. There's a principle one of two, of course, also, and that, that Dr. Miller and other funders have talked about, and that is there's, just, there's a, a rejection of the founders' understanding. Uh, but I think there's also the other element to it, that there is, a, there is something uh, unsettling uh, about those appeals, um, although also something necessary. Question for Dr. Burns. Um, I was persuaded by the bulk of your talk, but in the end of your talk, you raised the, the following question. If Christians are called to, in the way that perhaps Plato asks them to be called to, adhere first and foremost to a higher conception of justice than perhaps the state can supply, did you guys say Plato? Yeah. Um, what? Why? Why? Why does the uh, politics issue important to Augustine differ from what came before? What do you mean by issuing forth? Why do people take their bearings from Augustine? Uh, what, why do the political systems that they engage in um, differ so markedly from the successive realm? The success of Rome being owed to the success of classical political philosophy? I'm not sure. I, the short answer is that I've never, no more seen a political, I've seen about as many political actors who actually took their bearings from Augustine as I have who've seen that actually took their bearings from Plato. <laughs> That's not true in Rome, right? The Stoics were very prominent, both those off the set, which ultimately found its way back to the academy, and they were. Well, sure, Augustine. Only Roman citizens. Augustine ultimately finds his way back to the academy too, but I think he was better playing this than the Stoics were. So, you put up all your conversations together. Who determines what is moral? Is the individual determined? Is the church or religion determining what is moral? Or is it now so that you aren't the contemporary state? So, you know, I know you might have a lot of very opinions on it. Um, but I'll give you an example because the military for quite some time. The first thing anybody going into the military says is, it will bear true faith and allegiance to the United States Constitution. So I think that's an interesting thing to think about. It's more what we are thinking about when we say the virtue of the citizen. You know, I grew up Roman Catholic, so I have obligations to my church. But I'm making an allegiance or bear true faith and allegiance to the United States Constitution. And every military person will take that and say, okay, you know, I'm weighing out the things I'm doing right and wrong. What am I doing this for? Am I doing this for God and country? Am I doing this for Right. So I think it's an interesting dilemma. And, you know, soldiers are always going to be a reflection of the citizenry at some level. I think every citizen is going to think about that. So, uh, but I'd ask to bring back my question after. But in your estimate, what do you think uh, is more, is it the individual now, or is it a combination of the individual, the civic minded, you know, this is what the state's funding, or is it more of a religion? Do we have more of a, a unity of thought as each? To the extent that people, I think generally speaking, to the extent that people today are animated in the public sphere by some kind of religious principle, they are almost entirely afraid to express that. And so instead they say, well, you know, for economic reasons, I can be honest. But so that, that I think is, it may be a big very will be a principle that animates a lot of people in their actions, but it's something that they, they recognize is not going to be persuasive uh, but here's from one way I think of, of getting at it. I, I used this example in, in, in class the other day. Um, it seems to me almost, uh, and this, because this gets to the question of, of citizenship and, and the attachment to the Constitution, um, I, I, almost everyone um, would accept it as legitimate um, the order that was given on September 11th to shoot down a uh, commercial airline. 
clearly nothing in the law allows for that. Okay, what justifies that? I don't think you can say there. Everyone would say one thing would justify. It. So, to what extent there is agreement, a consensus on that? Uh, uh, because that, that gets to the question of the, the higher law, really. The higher what's higher than the Constitution? So you, you might say, yeah, we're attached to the Constitution, but of course the Supreme Court is attached to the Constitution. So why should I be attached? To uh, uh, Congress isn't attached to it. Why should I? Uh, I mean, you shouldn't say it's a soldier. Uh, but it is. I think it's a question a lot of Americans ask themselves. Uh, so, but it, 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 again, I, I think you come up with millions of disparate answers. Do you think we're moving? I'm sorry. Do you think that the actual society is a merging of It's moving in a direction where we have a unity of these things, or are we moving towards the individual? that each person thinks they're isolated from the government, and it's well, not part of anything. Or are they moving towards a, trying to have a super harmonious balance between religion, their personality, and their state, and then you know, their own person? Well, I would say we are massively moving in the, in the direction away from sort of public consensus. But others may have different views. I don't know. I guess I'll, I'll take a crack at it. Um, from the standpoint of um, at least practice in the, in the 20th century, and then going back to kind of the progressive understanding of this question, number one, the basis of morality is in nature. Um, so their understanding of the, the history was the process by which human beings were becoming all that they could be. Um, so that that is the foundation of morality. Um, the state becomes the primary agent for uh, the promotion of that aim. And that aim is comprehensive. So uh, the exact aim, the, the aim of history, which becomes the aim of the state in an advanced stage of development, is man's comprehensive good. And so um, in my talk, I was talking kind of about where Richard T. Healy is saying, um, is, is invoking the conception of the polis as the model for the right understanding of the relationship between um, the government and the individual. He also likes to characterize this, uh, as other progressives do, as when the state becomes ordered towards its proper object, the comprehensive good of man, the soul and mind of man, as Ely says, um, we will have overcome, in principle, the separation of church and state. So that the state will now take, as its proper aim, the, uh, the, <laughs> the proper concern for the, the care of the individual soul. And that will give it the authority um, and, and this is where you, you begin to see particular um, um, tensions arising between, shall we say, more orthodox conceptions, Christian conceptions of where the good of the soul lies, uh, with the progressive kind of secularized version of this. Because insofar as the progressives are clear, the aim of the state is the comprehensive welfare of man, and there is no limit on its ability to promote that aim. And where that requires the state to, um, uh, to um, um, regulate or prevent uh, actions uh, that are in accord with um, a more traditional, especially Catholic conception of where the, the welfare of the soul lies. That's fine, because that's in the end the the Catholic conception or a more orthodox uh, Protestant understanding that would resist that. That by itself is kind of a testament to the primitive nature of their understanding of the human. No, go ahead. Actually, I want, you want to follow up? Yeah, I have a million questions. Though. Okay, I just wanted to answer the question that was posed earlier. Um, this, this may just simply be a restatement of the issue really than answering your question. This may be more a restatement than an answer. Um, but I guess, you know, you, you, you began by saying who decides? Does the individual decide, et cetera? And I think it's... I suppose it's obvious, but important to remember that the individual always decides. Because in the end, there's only a brain and a will. And, and, the, and the only ones who have brains and wills are individuals. That, that's, in the end, you have to have some measure of, if you've got human action, uh, you, you have individual action. Um, the, the, the real question is, to what extent is the individual operating in making the decision? Um, 
type operate in isolation? And to what extent he, operates in, he or she operates in isolation? First is an interesting question. Is there a right answer, right way to do things? Um, and a right thing, a right answer not only in the particular, but in general situations. A right human answer, not just a right answer for uh, Upham at this hour, at this time, in this manner, in this place. If you think there is, there are right an there is a right answer across a uh, person's time, or maybe even across times, then you're going to say, well, uh, then I'm very interested in what other people have, have said. Especially if I have faith that those other people are, as, are interested in finding the right answer like I am. Um, you might even turn that, turn that into, into a respect for tradition. The idea that, uh, and, and here I think a lot of the progressives would, would reject that because they'd say, each age has its own answer. Individu there's a right answer for each age, and, 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 but there's not a right answer across ages. Whatever, you're, you do, whatever the question we're asking, you know, to, who decides uh, what to do, the individual decides, but there's an interesting, there's a different question where the individual says, hmm, maybe I should see what other people are thinking. Maybe I should see what other people are thinking in, in other times. Maybe I'm bound by a tradition. Maybe I'm bound by purported religious authority or purported political authority. And, and in the end, it's really, you, you, you mentioned in the military the, the rules that you obey the Constitution. But each one of these questions is com comes up as to what the individual soldier does at the moment. Uh, one interpretation would be, your allegiance is to the Constitution, but the, the, the relationship of you and the President and the Constitution is kind of like you, the Pope, and divine revelation. Yes, you will lead your allegiance to revelation, but there's one supreme interpreter and authority of that, what that means. Um, so, by obeying the president, you're obeying God. Or by obeying the president, you're obeying the Constitution. And there might be all types of other interesting, uh, you know, questions there. Um, I don't, as far as I can tell, most people I've talked to in the military would agree that that oath means, may mean disobedience to the president when he says, surround the Congress and start shooting. Because um, that's what the Constitution told me to do. Um, and you, given the fertility of human imagination, it's very possible someone could say that with a straight face. Um, so those just, I'm just, maybe just restating the problem. Okay. And I will. I mean, just, I, I, I like your example just because uh, it's actually, I think, the most of an example for Americans of an issue I was trying to bring up in, in my talk, which is that um, when, you, when you, you say we have the right to net national self-defense, it's not the defense of individuals. The individuals are dying. It's the defense of the Constitution. And soldiers know that better than anybody, I think. Um, and so when you talk about the right to kill on the battlefield, the obligation to kill on the battlefield, uh, the obligation to die on the battlefield, you're talking about <coughs> obligations to kill and die in defense of a particular political regime. And therefore, the question is, for a Christian, um, whether that regime merits his or her allegiance. I don't think that question I don't think there should be any question for a Christian that the ultimate authority to which he appeals in making that decision is God. There's no question, like, well, there's God on the one hand, but it's my country on the other hand. Oh, man. No, that one's easy for a Christian. The question is, what does God say? That's, that's the problem. So it has to be about each individual and how you serve. And we have Not a balance between the competing claims of God and country. If they compete, it's got a, but you have different authorities. The Constitution says to do this, well, I'm going to do this. There's the question. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
those kinds of laws or those uh, provisions sort of bear with them some understanding of, of virtue of citizenship, meaning a virtue that's oriented towards the whole country, the whole community, as opposed to the virtue which is of an opposition against the, the common enemy known as the government. I was wondering, Dr. Miller, I guess, if you would say, from what you're talking, found, the founders of a lot would agree with anything of those claims. That, that, um, the, that the founders were a lot who was more or less in agreement with what they did in practice. Would, would, uh, would, yeah, either of them would agree with what they said as to, like, the, uh, as to what they said about uh, um, this rights based country and manner of governing the country uh, is somehow supposed to produce or generate a, a virtue of citizenship, which is oriented towards a, a virtue of, of the citizen, of the individual citizen, which is oriented towards the whole community. Yeah, in the sense which I think at the end of Dr. Burns. Marks. He was just suggesting that um, the Christian, in evaluating uh, whether they should do what the, the state is asking them or what the government is, is requiring of them, would have to consider whether it's a just regime. We would have to consider whether it is a, um, uh, a regime that, in, in the end, I think I, I think it's about any criteria for how to uh, make that assessment. And you're not going to get me to it. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the, in the founders' understanding, part of the, the way in which you would resolve that is, you know, is 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 the requirement that is being placed upon you in the service of, um, you know, protecting and preserving a government that whose purpose it is to secure my liberty. And my part of that for the Christian is secure my right to worship God and to the dictates of my own conscience. I guess what I'm asking is, the fact the lot in the uh, Federalist 57 you presented, do those, the citizen of that kind of a country, do they ever look at the government as anything other than an instrument of potential evil? As a potential evil? Well, potential instrument of evil. Something which you have to look at. Yeah. I mean, so in other words, in opposition to the progressive well, it, 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 complete civic yeah, vote. Yeah, are you asking whether it's a necessary evil or simply evil? I'm right? asking whether the founders ever would have said, like, you should have virtues where you're concerned about the public good more than your own. Well, in, 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 in the sense in which, look, if, if you're being, if the government is requiring you, in the founders' sense, to uh, sacrifice in time of war, okay, um, you know, that is, uh, you are being asked to potentially lay down your life for the country. And it seems to me that from the standpoint of kind of a, a law based understanding, on the one hand, um, obviously you're laying down your life, that's your life. But on the other hand, you would be willing to do it if the purpose of the regime was um, essential for securing your liberty and preventing you from being uh, something in slavery. So, in other words, it's, it would still be, um, you could say it's not your immediate self interest. But um, it may well be much better than the options. Can I just in there with this? Why, on a walking basis, why do you think that one would voluntarily give up one's life, as distinct from doing something risky, which we do all the time, like every time I go into a car? But why would you consider it an obligation to give up your life if, if for the sake of preserving your liberty, if this law says your liberty is valued only as offense to your, to your preservation? Um, because if you assume that in being enslaved, that your life will be secure and you will be. So in other words, it becomes, I think, uh, a matter of proving self-interest in evaluating one's options. But that, that's a different answer than that question, I think. That it does at least prove self-interest. Yeah, so there is no such thing as yes, a virtue for the family. In the sense in which you, can, you, you serve the public regardless of what the public's doing, is that what you mean? No, regardless of whether it's in your interest, that's what we're trying. Yeah, but, yeah, so regardless, no, 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 so what I'm basically saying is on the grounds of improving self-interest, you will be willing to sacrifice, put yourself at risk, potentially, only um, for the sake of a better securing your long-term liberty. So there'll be evidence in that now. And then, and then, and then, and then, and Yeah, so it's, it's not your immediate self-interest, but it's kind of a proven self-interest in terms of what's likely to occur. So what's the standard of making that judgment call? Is it like how I happen to read the 
constitution or something like that, or is it what my commander in chief commanded me to do? Like, uh, like Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Dr. kind of suggested that um, we ought to have concern about generating. Let's just get the words right here. Uh, how do we form a robust moral universe within the framework of contemporary political order? Shouldn't we have a concern with um, our laws, including, especially at the constitutional level, like sort of informing inadvertently or intentionally a sense of morality which is um, in agreement with the political order? My, my, I'm asking if um, that seems to me to say like something like. The founders expected, or if the founders didn't intend it, the founders intended that this would happen regardless of whether or not it was ever explicitly stated that we're trying to make moral citizens out of, uh, out of our people. Um, which they plainly never really said in obvious words, although I think they might maybe they did. Uh, but that was, the, that was the intention such that the citizen would always be in agreement with the political order. And sure, a certain criminal could find his way into office like happens in Chicago all the time or Illinois. But nevertheless, that. Uh, that <laughs> I was just wondering, like I said, like once again, if um, really all the government is supposed to do is make sure a bunch of absolutely, absolute individuals can make their own political choices. That's what you're saying. That was the, the, uh, the founders' understanding. And then it, 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 that seems to be what you said. So my question was, is there what informs the prudence? Is there a regime or something like that which informed it prior or not? No, because if, if I, I want to maybe. Maybe disagree with it, but it's you. That, that, it, it, I don't care. No, look, I, I think um, I, I understood you to be asking what the ground would be if you are um, a member of a locking social compact and you're being called upon potentially to lay down your life. What on earth would be a possible ground for you to be to do that? And so I was saying, in my understanding, I think that um, if you're going to recur back to uh, principles and, and making a decision, that would be. The defense. In other words, that you would, as Block suggests, you know, what you can expect from slavery is not uh, a better situation. Um, now, if, as a practical matter, are there other ways of, of shaping the citizenry that may come into play that would alleviate the need for everyone to actually make um, you know, uh, so enlightened an assessment of their situation? Double lives, in other words. No, I'm not necessarily suggesting just a normalize it. Uh, you know, um, I think part of Locke's rhetoric, um, you can see at the beginning of the first treatment, for example, um, is designed to kind of shape the passions of the people in the sense in which um, to make them hate slavery <laughs> without having to, to assume how it would actually affect them. Um, so shaping their passions in certain ways, not like that's satisfying. It will happen because we're over time. Right. So uh, there, are soon, there are still more questions, but uh, here we are after six o'clock. So please join us in positive ways uh, in the reception, and please thank the channel. So thanks.